Dr. Michael Shermer is founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, a monthly columnist for Scientific American. He's a regular contributor to a ton of different publications, including Time.com. He is a presidential fellow at Chapman University. He's author of a new book called The Moral Arc, How Science and Reason Lead Humanity Toward Truth, Justice, and Freedom. He's also author of tons of other books, including one that sort of led me into this podcast. I borrowed the title and changed it just a little bit, Michael. Uh, But your book is called uh, Why People Believe Weird Things. And I wanted to talk about that on the radio, and I thought this would be a great opportunity. Dr. Shermer, thanks for being here. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, I didn't know that about the, uh, the adoption of the book title. That's great. Let's talk about Ben Carson, can we? I mean, we'll just start with him. With a straight face. <laughs> Republican presidential candidate. He's a product of Johns Hopkins. He is a neurosurgeon. He's not a stupid man. And yet, he doesn't seem to embrace or understand basic evolutionary biology. He made the claim about the Star of David being on the, the American $1 bill. He has He's mentioned that he believed that the pyramids were built so that the biblical Joseph could store grain. And we're all looking at this otherwise intelligent man, and we're wondering, what the hell is going on? Michael, what the hell's going on? Well, he's not just a a product of Johns Hopkins University. He's also a product of the Seventh-day Adventists. And in this case, his religion is trumping his science, uh, because uh, Seventh-day Adventists are creationists. They're largely young Earth creationists, or at the very least, old Earth creationists. But uh, they take the creationist model in, in any case and, and, and don't accept most of the science related to that. Now, how can you get through medical school believing that? The answer is you don't have to really understand evolutionary biology to get through med school. You can actually take all those classes, memorize all the parts and functions of the body and, and get through chemistry and calculus and all that stuff without actually ever studying Darwin. I'm sure he, I'm sure he knows something about it. I'm sure he's read about it, but he just rejects it because of his religion. But it isn't necessary to to do what he did. Uh, you know, it's not to denigrate neurosurgery at all. It's it, you know, it's super technical field. But you don't you don't really have to understand how natural selection works to operate on a brain. You know, the, these are largely independent fields. So, I mean, in a little, in in a way, it'd be like asking what what does knowing about neurosurgery have to do with economic policy. Nothing. He's not qualified to understand the economy just because he's a neurosurgeon. Uh, and so you can be smart in one area and, you know, really dumb in other areas. And that's the case for most of us. It's just that most of us aren't shooting our mouths off on national television running for president. Uh, and uh, and most of us, you know, don't don't venture into fields we know nothing about and make public statements like that. Um, and so that, that's the short answer. Um, you know, psych- psychologically speaking, as I say in why people believe we're things, is that smart people are, believe we're things because they're better at rationalizing beliefs they arrived at for non-smart reasons or that they hold for non-smart reasons. That is, people hold beliefs for emotional reasons, psychological reasons, religious reasons, and political, ideological reasons, and then they back into it with evidence after the fact that they – you know, filter to fit, you know, what they already believe, the confirmation bias. And smart people, educated people, are better at that. And so they, they're even, they, they convince themselves as well as some of their other other followers that, you know, they're really onto something because they're so smart. But in fact, it's really just the opposite. Let's talk about confirmation bias for those who may not know what it is. Can you sort of flesh it out for us? Yep. Uh, so the confirmation bias is where you look for and find confirming evidence for what you already believe and you ignore the disconfirming evidence. That is, you remember the hits, you forget the misses. You just filter out information that doesn't uh, confirm what you want to be true and, and, and you allow in the information that fits. Everybody does it. We do it in all walks of life. Uh, there's a huge body of literature and cognitive psychology about this. Uh, uh, this bias. It's kind of the mother of all cognitive biases. There's, there's a host of these biases, dozens, uh, but that's the biggest one. Uh, and uh, so, for example, just to run through a few of the experiments, like if you tell uh, a subject that this person they're about to meet is introverted, shy, uh, not particularly forthcoming or gregarious, uh, and then you meet this person and fill out a little questionnaire about their personality, that's how they will be described. On the other hand, if you tell somebody else that this person is gregarious and 
extroverted, outgoing, uh, and then they meet the exact same person who has says the same things, they will rate them as outgoing extroverts. In other words, they'll find the things that seem to fit the diagnosis or the label. This is true in the mental health profession. We know from Robert Rosenhan's famous experiment in, in the uh, late 60s, uh, he and his fellow, and it, he was a professor, his graduate students checked themselves into a bunch of different mental hospitals. And, uh, you know, just all they were doing was complaining of hearing voices, um, and nothing very specific. And, and the moment they were checked in and diagnosed, they, they, they said, well, I don't hear the voices anymore. And then they acted completely normal from there on. The diagnoses were made by the psychiatrists working at these hospitals. And, and the, you know, patient uh, descriptions were made by the employees at the hospital. The patients themselves weren't patients at all. You know, they just then proceeded to act completely normally. And as Rosanann describes it, the, you know, the other patients knew right away, oh, come on, you know, you guys are journalists or something. You're here investigating the hospital, right? You know, because they could tell they were acting normal. But the psychiatrists didn't get it. Uh, you know, they, they, they filtered everything that the pseudo patients did as further evidence of their schizophrenic tendencies and, you know, the, the erupting libidinal urges coming out in the painting, you know, this kind of nonsense. And, uh, and then after the experiment was over, they had to get out on their own, which took many, many weeks in, 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 ca in some cases. It's a little scary, actually. It's hard to get out once you're in. Uh, he then told these hospitals about it, and they said, oh, well, you know, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be faked, you know, uh, there's no way. Try it again, send some pseudo patients and real patients to them and we'll be able to tell the difference. And, uh, it, it, and so then, you know, patients started coming in as usual and, and they, you know, reported back that they figured out who it was and when, when in fact he didn't send anybody in. Uh, you know, so it, it's... Now, what's that about? Is that that they were... The staff was predisposed to automatically assume or believe that these people had some sort of psychological trouble. So, so they were just going to see it because they just expected it? Correct. Yeah, the power of expectation, the power of labels and language to determine thought. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit of an indictment of the mental health profession to the extent that these psychiatric diagnoses are very subjective. You know, it's a list of symptoms, uh, behaviors. Uh, you know, patient exhibits X, Y, and Z most of the time, but not all of the time. And maybe there's 20 different symptoms of schizophrenia. How many do you have to have before you get the label? Is it 10? Is it 12? Is it 15? Is it 7? You know, there's very little consistency across experts on, on what constitutes that particular set of uh, uh, characteristics that makes up a diagnosis. And uh, it's a real problem. It's why the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, the DSM keeps evolving. You know, homosexuality was a disease in the 1950s, and it was finally taken out in the 70s. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of those kinds of things that, um, uh, that, that are very disturbing. But, you know, in this context, I'm just talking about the power of, of labels and the confirmation bias, that once you, you have a theory about something, you then just find the evidence to fit it. Uh, conspiracy theories work this way. You know, the moment you think that 9-11 was an inside job, then you just go back and read the newspapers and watch the news reports and go, aha, there was something very odd right there at that corner. And look at this person acting very strange. And, you know, you start filtering out things that don't fit and filtering in things that do fit. It's like the JFK assassination. You know, once you decide, okay, I think it was a conspiracy. Then you look at Dealey Plaza and you look at those photographs. Famous example, there's a guy with an umbrella standing there on the, you know, on the grassy knoll there. What's he doing with an umbrella? It was a perfectly sunny day. Uh, what, you know, why would somebody have an umbrella? Clearly that umbrella was a, a rifle of some kind. And he had a rifle hit, you know, built into the thing and he shot Kennedy with it. Finally, that guy came forward uh, in the 80s and said, yeah, I'm the umbrella man. Because there was all these conspiracy theories about the umbrella man. And he said, I was out there protesting Kennedy. I, I was against his foreign policy and Cuba and all that, and that the umbrella was uh, going back to the to, to the pre-World War II when Neville Chamberlain came back from Munich after caving into Hitler's demands um, to acquire um, uh, Austria, and, and, and so he came back and he had an umbrella, and so the umbrella became the symbol of protest against 
uh, accommodationism with foreign, you know, about foreign policy. So what Kennedy was supposed to make that connection as he turned the corner. I mean, that's sort of a big leap, isn't it? Oh, it's a huge leap. But again, once you, once you have the idea in mind, then, you know, everything becomes pregnant with meaning like, Ooh, what's that? Ooh, what is that over there? And, uh, if you don't believe it, then, you know, those sort of things just go flying right by your senses. Oh, Michael, you just guarantee that the comment section is going to go insane with 9-11. Consp- I mean, how many years has it been? And it's it even among the quote unquote skeptical community, it's it's especially in the month of September, it's rampant. You know, Building 7 and Thermite, controlled demolition, consp- I mean, one thing after the other. The only thing missing is the Illuminati, right? But these are intelligent people. Oh, yes, yes. Again, or, intelligence and belief are, are orthogonal, as I say in, in my book. That is, they're, they're like this. They're, they're not really related to each other. It's not like one goes up, the other goes up or down. Uh, you know, they're independent of each other, except for the fact that if you're smart and educated and very uh, well-read, you're, you're better able to defend the beliefs that you hold for very non-smart reasons. Anyway, that's how it works. If you're conservative, you read the Wall Street Journal you you know listen to conservative talk radio and so on if you're liberal you read the new york times and and you listen to npr and you know it's just we all filter the world around us by uh our beliefs you know we just we we mostly want to hang around fellow liberals or fellow conservatives we mostly want to read people that already agree with us because it you know it's rewarding it feels good you get a little dopamine hit when you know you read something that confirms what you already believe and you know we know the neuroscience of it uh, but the confirmation belief that confirmation bias is very powerful and it's very disruptive to getting at the truth, which is why science has this self-correcting machinery built in, this peer review system. This you can't operate in a in a vacuum. You need to you know bounce your ideas off of other people who can tell you that you're wrong, and they have to feel free that they can tell you that you're wrong, which is why we have free speech in a civil society. We need to, you know, nobody's going to get it right all the time. We need to have people bouncing ideas off each other and criticizing each other or else we're going to go down the path uh, incorrectly. I was talking to the skeptic, Dr. Harriet Hall, and she was talking about sort of her acid test for when a claim is made. And of course, she's in the skepticism business, the debunking business. There's a lot of bunk out there, as I've heard you often say. And I think uh, I'm paraphrasing Dr. Hall, forgive me if I, if I screw this up, but it's something like, if you hear a claim made, go and look up what the most vehement critics of the claim have to say about it and start there. That's correct. Well, that's true not only in her field of medicine and, and so-called alternative medicine, um, but, but all claims. Uh, you know, what, you know that, that sounds good in principle, but, you know, what does your biggest critic have to say about it? You know, oh, I don't know. I don't read those. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, maybe you should. Hey, is it possible to live a bias-free life? I know the answer, but I just, you know, we, we hear this constant charge to remove bias from the process. And I think as human beings, it's impossible. What do we do with this? Yeah, well, so far, I'm the only one I know who's been able to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't tell you my secret because, you know, it's patented. <laughs> uh, well, you know, obviously, of course not. Um, but, 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 but what we can do is try to limit the extent to which our biases can distort our perceptions of reality, our political beliefs, our economic beliefs, our religious beliefs, whatever, even our scientific skeptical beliefs, by interacting with other people and and, and reading and listening what they have to say, re- reading our critics. Um, I do try to read my critics. I don't like it. Uh, you know, people that, that uh, particularly like with my new book, you know, it's been challenged pretty seriously by a number of people. I don't like reading it because I, you know, by the time I was done writing it, I felt like I, I, I was right. Now, wait a minute. Are these religious people that are coming after you because they believe morality comes from above or? Yeah, well, there is that, of course, but I expected that. Uh, no, I mean, from my fellow scientists and skeptics who think that, you know, for example, I argue in the moral art that, you know, moral values can be objective and true, really, absolutely, not just culturally relevantly true, but but absolutely true based on a, you know, a universal human nature. And not everybody agrees with me on that. And, uh, but, you know, there's been some really good criticisms that I've read that, you know, has helped me refine my thinking, helped me, you know, further develop my ideas along that, those ways. 
And I don't, I don't like everybody else. I don't like doing it. <laughs> I'd rather just think, well, I'm right. And that's it. I can move on to the next project. Uh, but that isn't how it works. And particularly with hard areas like that. I mean, it's, it, you know, debunking the 9-11 truthers or creationists or the Holocaust deniers, you know, I, I, that, those were much easier targets, you know, in my earlier books than, than writing about this kind of stuff, which, is, you know, it's not clear what the answer is. And, and, you know, no one has the right answer maybe. And, you know, that's, that's much harder. It's more anxiety producing. It's, you feel less stable in your work. Like, gee, I don't really know if I'm going down the right path or not. It's really hard. You know, so like when I was writing my book, Steven Pinker gave me a lot of good feedback. And, uh, you know, he's, he's probably the smartest guy I know. And also the most honest. In ter I knew he would be honest in telling me not what I wanted to hear, but, you know, I would just send him a few paragraphs or a, a few pages or something and go, am I on the right track here? And, you know, he would always tell me. And I thought, okay, this is what we all need that. You know, somebody to go, no, 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 here's why I think you're wrong here. And he's like, oh, okay. I invoke his book all the time, The Better Angels of Our Nature, just a masterwork. It's just so freaking good and so rich with information, you know. A absolutely. And Steve's very good about um, crediting other people and, and their work. And and, uh, and he does that same thing. He, you know, he bounces ideas off people and, and listens to what they have to say, you know, it, all good scientists do that, and, and all of us need to do that, in, in our, in, including in our daily lives. Uh, you know, just because you might be wrong, it's it's the problem. I'm just writing about this problem now in uh, my latest column in Scientific American. I just turned in yesterday on the, the liberal bias in social science, particularly social psychology. Jonathan Haidt has this H A I D T. Jonathan Haidt. He's one of the great social scientists of our age, and he has this great story about he was at this social psychology conference uh, uh, in 2013, and he asked for a show of hands amongst about a thousand people. How many would you? How many of you are you know self-identified as being on the right, political right? You know, three hands out of a thousand go up. <laughs> and then how about libertarian? You know, fiscally conservative, socially liberal. You know, Twelve hands go up. You know. How about, to, you know, to the left, you know, everybody else, okay. Is it really possible that social psychology can have that kind of political bias and be doing truly objective research? No. And they just published this article that came out last month in, uh, uh, in uh, brain, brain, Behavior and Brain Sciences Journal. Uh, Pinker called it the most important article in the last, you know, couple of decades in all of social science. And it, it's, it's quite the good art. They really show how political bias sort of seeps into the cracks of the social science research, particularly social psychology. It's in ways you wouldn't even notice unless somebody pointed it out. I was reading in your book that we form beliefs first, right? I believe something before I know it. Is that an accurate way to say it, Michael? Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, yeah, Spinoza got that right. Spinoza said uh, that... You know, once you comprehend an idea, you just automatically believe it. And, and, and then to be a skeptic, you know, to, to doubt it requires an extra cognitive load. That is to say, you have to, you have, it's like lying. To, to, to tell a lie, you have to know what the truth is and then add another layer on top of it. So there's a higher, co bigger cognitive load there. Now, is there an evolutionary explanation for this? I know you've talked about the, the, the different types of... Um you know, the it's if you hear a rustling in the forest, is it the wind or is it a predator? I've heard this example. Does it relate to that at all, or what? Yes, it is because um, you know all these these uh, cognitive biases that we're talking about. These are what uh, Danny Con Kahneman calls rules of thumb. Uh, that is, they're they're just kind of ways of quickly calculating uh, what I should do next. You know, they're sort of proxies for behavior. And that if you spend too much time, like, why can't you just sit in the grass, you know, listening carefully and collecting more data to see if the rustle is, is a dangerous predator or just the wind? And the answer is dangerous predators don't wait around for you to collect more data about them. <laughs> That's why they're stealthy. That's why they're camouflaged. And uh, so we have to make snap decisions. So Kahneman calls this thinking fast and slow is the title of his book. The fast part is this rapid cognition, this intuition, this snap decisions, uh, this sort of type one thinking, this, um, you know, just assume all rustles in the grass are dangerous predators, just in case, uh, and, and, and ju just assume things that you comprehend are probably true, just in case they are, and then later you can evaluate it, 
gradually, slowly, you can apply reason and so on. But that take that that, that comes later. So the snap decisions are the initial line of, of thinking for, for those good evolutionary reasons. Have you seen the television show called Brain Games? Yeah, Mine? yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm fascinated by it. It was on Netflix. I just started to watch it. And by the time I was through with the fourth, fifth episode, I was paranoid about how much I don't trust my brain. I don't trust perception anymore. I'm, I'm, you know, it's amazing how easily we can be tricked. For many, perception is reality. I felt it. I saw it. I touched it. And therefore, it is true. It is real. But our brains actually can easily trick us into something else. Can we talk about the difference between perception and reality? Sure. So um, the, the, uh, you had a very good reason to be disturbed, as, as all of us are that study these areas, because um, those kinds of tricks that they use on television shows or that magicians use or that people that study illusions use to show how we don't always get reality right, those actually are tend to be exceptions to the rule. For the most part, your snap decisions about and your intuitions about things in, in the world are fairly accurate, and they work most of the time, which is why we evolved them in the first place. So, for example, you know, just think about uh, the famous smoke in the room experiments, you know, with uh, obedience to authority and conformity to group norms and, and things like that, going back to Milgram and Zimbardo and Solomon Ash and all those classic social psych experiments in which under, you know, these really weird conditions where, you know, you're sitting at, there in a room filling out a form with a bunch of other people and smoke is billowing in underneath the door. We, we did a replica of this a couple of years ago for uh, Dateline NBC, and it was hilarious. I mean, no, you know, our one and only subject, everybody else in the room was just actors working for us. You know, they would sit there and they'd look up like, oh, there's smoke coming in the room, and they'd look around and everybody else is filling out their form, ignoring it. It's like, oh, okay, so they go back to work. And, uh, you know, it's kind of hilarious that you can get people to do that. But, in fact, normally, if you were in a room with a bunch of strangers, none of whom were in on anything, and there was smoke coming in the room, they would do something. You know, it's, it would be very unusual for everybody in the room to just completely ignore the smoke. So usually somebody does something. And if nobody's doing something, it probably does mean there's no cause for alarm. Uh, and same thing with illusions. Yes, we can trick the brain with these unusual, you know, perceptual illusions. But most of the time when you look out, what you see really is there. It, it isn't a trick. Uh, and so it, for the most part, um, we're, our senses are good enough matching reality for survival purposes and uh, so we don't you don't you don't need to be that uh, upset with those <laughs> kinds of shows those shows are orchestrated to pick the the, the one example where you know you're you're, you're for sure going to get it wrong let's talk about deepak chopra for a few just because i always like to bring him up whenever we have an exchange michael you were on was it abc news that put together that exchange between you guys and chopra can you describe that event for me oh yes well um uh, Deepak had, had long wanted to do a debate with me at Caltech, um, and uh, you know, so we finally started putting this together for an event. And then he he called out of the blue one day and said, "Hey, I think I can get uh, ABC Dateline or ABC Nightline to tape it." It's like, okay, so they got involved and they said, "Yeah, but you know, for for television, we need more action. You know, a lot of exchanges like ta we want a tag team wrestling kind of event. So each of you get somebody else on your team, and then we'll do two by two. You know." Debate, debate, bam, 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 back and forth, which we did. And I got Sam Harris, and he got this woman, Jean Houston, who I never heard of. And it turns out that, you know, she she wasn't very helpful to his side, I think. You know, usually Deepak has those quantum physicists, uh, and, but she was more of sort of a, a, a mystic of, of, of sorts, a, a guru kind of person. Uh, but it was very, it was, it was very instructive. Uh, and you can watch this online, uh, you know, Deepak stringing together these words and phrases that sound super smart uh but but you know what do they really mean well that's kind of where i want to stop you for just a second i mean he's he was a physician right uh once chief of staff at new england memorial hospital he's not a stupid man um and yet he throws out all this stuff like aging is a learned behavior like aging is a choice you know and and he does a lot of speaking about the quantum. Did he toss out the quantum on stage with you guys? Oh, yes, yes. And uh, neither Sam or I are, are, are physicists. So, uh, but fortunately for us, uh, Leonard Maladnow was in the audience, and he is a, a physicist. And he, you know, he, he was a professor at Caltech. He worked with uh, Richard Feynman and Murray Gelman 
in the 1980s, and uh, uh, and he knows this area. So he had a he had a really funny line in the Q and A. If you watch this, you know he stands up and says, "Deepak, I I, un I understand all the words you're using, but I don't understand what they mean when you string them together that way." And uh, it, and this this led to him and and Deepak doing a book together called "The World the World Views." It's quite good. Uh, and and that's the key is the, that's the key difference there is Deepak has a different worldview than than you and I have. His worldview is is sort of a Buddhist or modified Buddhism, in which consciousness is the fundamental property of the universe and everything derives from that. Whereas you and I, as probably Western materialists, think of consciousness as derived from a brain matter, from brain activity, uh, from neural activity. And therefore, it's derivative. It's secondary. It's not a property of the universe. It's an emergent property from other components of the universe. But if you start at Deepak's position, his starting position, then what he says actually kind of makes sense if you're a Buddhist. But I'm not. So, you know, it, it really is just a, a starting point different. Let's talk about the word worldview. Someone embraces a Christian worldview. I did this, right? I started with the answer. And then I started asking the questions because I had already assumed or embraced a truth with a capital T. Uh, we all do this, I'm guessing, in some way? Uh, we do, yes. In fact, this is the case certainly in science as well. Maybe not worldview, but you know, when you're a graduate student in a lab, you're working under a professor, and he already or she already has a whole research protocol set up designed to test some particular hypotheses that's part of a larger theoretical model to explain some natural phenomenon. You're working within that. The, the, the chance of you, while you're working in there, overthrowing the whole paradigm is you know, very, very small. You know, this comes much later when, when you're an established professor and you can sort of pull back and look at the bigger picture and try some other uh, paradigm or research protocol. So it's the same kind of principle there. And then of course, people that pull back even broader and say, well, yes, but that that Western scientific materialist inductionist perspective of how we gain knowledge is itself flawed. This is something like what Deepak says. I mean, he loves science, but he's looking at science from a different perspective, starting with this other worldview, in which case, in my opinion, his confirmation bias is at work and he's only picking out the, the weird quantum experiments that seem to fit his theory of consciousness, that sort of thing. He, he would not agree with that, of course, but, <laughs> uh, but yes, um, you know, we all, we're all embedded in a worldview. You can't get out of it. Uh, so you, you just got to work within one or try to shift to a different one if you want to just take a different perspective. You were somewhat religious for a little while until you weren't. What's one of the weirdest things or some of the weirdest things you used to believe? I mean, did you ever hold any belief or, you know, did you know something to be true? And later on you thought, geez, what was I thinking? <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of times actually, uh, this is along the same lines of what have you changed your mind about? Well, quite a few things, um, you know, just belief in God. But uh, but because I was a Christian, I just assumed I had to be a creationist. I hadn't really studied evolution or creationism. I, I just didn't know much about it, but I just assumed I was because I thought that was part of the package. Uh, and so when I actually started taking science courses, I realized this has nothing to do with you know my religious beliefs and 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 the stuff that creationists say is you know no you know no no connection to reality at all you know so I gave up all that nonsense and but also when I was in graduate school even though I abandoned religion I still thought there might be something to the paranormal um, you know this was in the seventies when Thelma Moss had a lab at UCLA a paranormal lab studying uh, Curlian photography and. And, uh, you know, psi, ESP, telekinesis, this sort of thing. And, and there seemed to be, you know, examples where they were finding positive results. So I thought, well, you know, I'm just a lowly graduate student. What do I know? And these are professional PhD psychologists. You know, they're smarter than me. So maybe there's something to it. And it was around that time in the late 70s that the uh, skeptical movement began to take off. And, and I, you know, I saw people like the amazing Randy on TV doing the stuff that, the you know so-called psychics were doing and I realized oh well okay so a magician can fool these scientists how do we, how do we really know that you know what these psychologists are studying is not just they're not just being fooled and you know so I, be, I began to be a little skeptical that way and then as the years you know rolled on I became much more committed to the kind of materialist 
um, you know, scientific worldview, and and it's not that we define those things out by definition, but in a way, it, you know, there's no such thing as the paranormal. There's just the normal and things we haven't explained yet. So, for example, if it turned out that Deepak was right that quantum consciousness is the theory that explains consciousness, and and therefore you and I could actually read each other's thoughts through this quantum field, you know, spooky action at a distance, the, the double slit experiment and all that. If that were true, then th th that wouldn't be ESP or psychic power. That would just be some form of quantum physics and neuroscience. You know, it would just be enveloped within the scientific worldview. Now, I don't believe that, but, but, but that's my point, is that if, it, if, if, that, if there were evidence for it, then it, it would just be part of the normal world. Is it the same concept that, uh, like, once alternative medicine is proven to heal, it no longer is alternative, that kind of thing? Right, yeah. Yeah, there's no such thing as alternative medicine. There's just, you know, medical claims that are proven and all the rest that are not proven. And, uh, yeah, so, or as I think it's Tim mentioned, it says, you know, what do you call, what do you call alternative medicine with evidence? Medicine. I think about guys like you and James Randi and whatnot. I mean, you're presented all the time with stuff that you debunk. I mean, you see it, you test it, oh, come on. And you get to probably, I would assume, get to a point where the second you hear a claim, you're like, oh, yeah, this is going to be a waste of my time. I mean, so then the question becomes, if someone was to one day come through with a discovery that was genuine, would you be predisposed to be skeptical against it, to disbelieve it? Are you jaded, Michael, after all of these claims have sort of fallen by the wayside? I don't know if it's jaded so much as... It would be a little bit like asking someone like Feynman or, you know, a living physicist today who gets these alternative theories of physics in the mail every week. I get them all the time. I'm sure the, the big, big name physicists I know, people like Brian Greene and Michio Kaku, they get these alternative theories every week. You know, these are just amateurs that, you know, they, they don't work in the field. And, you know, they, you know, Newton was wrong and Einstein was wrong and Feynman was wrong and Stephen Hawking's wrong. And, you know, this weekend I worked out in my garage, the true theory of the universe. Okay. Probably not. <laughs> you know, so you're sort of predisposed, yes, to be skeptical because, you know, most of these alternative ideas are wrong. And, and in that sense, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, because, you know, science is conservative for, for the, the very reason that most new ideas that people come up with, even professional scientists, are wrong. So it's good to be skeptical. And, and so we, we start with the, the default position of the null hypothesis that whatever you think is true isn't. And now you have the burden of proof of overcoming the null hypothesis that is convincing us that you're true. And I'm sure the FDA gets inundated with, you know, people that send them, you know, cold remedies and cancer cures and AIDS cures and so on, and here's my drug, will you approve it? Not without clinical epidemiological evidence, we won't. Uh, you know, they just, the FDA just assumes that somebody submitting a product, uh, it's not gonna work until they, you know, present the evidence that it does. And that's true for everything in science. Well, because now we've established that none of us are immune to bias, none of us are immune to bad information, even, I call it, uh, and this may be inaccurate, but I call it the place in the brain where the weird shit lives. I don't know if that's sci scientifically tenable, but is, does that speak to compartmentalization? Is that even an accurate way that otherwise we're rational, except we have this one little cherished spot in the in our in our minds that we sort of protect the weird? Is there any merit to that at all, or am I just crazy? No, no, no. I, I actually wrote a column, one of my Scientific American columns, called the Logic Type Compartment. I called it. Uh, like a watertight compartment, it's just a little barrier in there and you hold that belief and, uh, you know, that's our best explanation for why, you know, scientists believe in God, you know, because we don't think there's evidence for it and, you know, they're holding it in there as a, you know, a separate thing. You know, it's like, um, um, who's the New York Times science writer? Um, uh, I forget the woman's name. Uh, it'll come to me in a moment, but she had this great uh, analogy of, you know, the, the, the physicist that goes to church on Sunday, or, you know, where's your control group? You know, for the resurrection, I believe in the resurrection. That's nice. Where's the control group? Oh, Natalie Andrews. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great analogy. What, what, why aren't they asking for that kind of evidence at, on Sunday that they do on Monday at the lab? And the answer is because they're holding them in separate compartments. Well, I think that leads into my question. Where do we go from here? How do I sort of 
as best as possible, bullshit proof my life? How do I, how do I protect against my own biases? How do I keep from outsmarting myself? What tools do you recommend? Yeah, well, the baloney detection kit uh, that we that we publish uh, on skeptic.com, you can go there and check it out. It's just asking certain questions like, you know, how do I know that this is true? Uh, what's the evidence for it? Who made the claim? You know, have they made similar kind of claims before? Uh, what's the quality of the evidence? Everybody says they have evidence. What's the quality of the evidence? And, you know, it, th does that claim fit with how we know the rest of the world works? You know, so you talk about miracles, you know, like the raising of the dead, the resurrection, something like that. You know, well, it, it, it ends up kind of getting defined out of that paradigm by saying it's a one-off event. Yeah, well, lots of scientific things are one-off events. You know, meteor impacts is a one-off event. There still should be some evidence for it. You know, so you can just kind of push a particular claim into the channel of, you know, any scientific claim that would be made and ask those kinds of sets of questions that any scientist would ask about any claim. And you could apply that to, you know, political claims. You know, should we build a wall, you know, down at Mexico? You know, is, would that, will that work? Or should we institute gun control measures or not? You know, will it work? Well, in principle, these are, although they, they appear on the surface, pure political kind of issues that we just debate and yell and scream at each other. But in principle, we should be able to answer those questions scientifically. You know, if our goal is to lower the homicide rate, in America, which is you know on the order of eight per hundred thousand, about eight times higher than it is in Europe, uh, and the gun-related homicides, you know, is just astronomically off the charts compared to any other developed nation. You know, what we should be able to ask ourselves scientifically: what measures can we take to reduce the numbers? That's all. You know, take politics out of it and just treat it as a scientific question. Which, this is one of the things I try to do in the moral art. And, uh, you know, that most people, including scientists, my fellow skeptics, say, well, there's certain things that are not, can't be tested scientifically. Well, I think we haven't tried hard enough. I think, there, I think we should try to test everything, take everything out of the bias bubble and put it into the, the science machine and see if it holds up. Congratulations on the new book, The Moral Arc. I hope it's doing well. I hope people are getting into it. I love approaching morality and ethics outside of this sort of religious ownership. You know, the church decided... Well, we're, it's proprietary and we own morality. And the moral arc actually says, not so much. And it's a beautiful thing. So congratulations on the book. Yes, I think it's good that, uh, you know, that, of course, you know, secular philosophers, someone like Spinoza, or Immanuel Kant, or David Hume, you know, they've been talking about this for centuries, but there's still this, this kind of barrier that scientists have, almost like, it, almost like the, the brick, brick and mortar buildings on a, campus you know it's like well the biology people are over there and the physics people are over there and the moral philosophers are over here and you know most of these professors are not religious but they still treat moral philosophy as something different than you know psych psychology or cognitive science or neuroscience or physics or biology and and people like sam harris and stephen pinker and myself are saying wait let, let's break down the barriers forget the brick and mortar buildings let's just throw it all in one big you know, thing. This is science. We want to know what's the answer to this particular question. So you're saying that the the question of morality is a scientific question. That's correct. Yes, that is what I think. And not just you know why we are moral. You know, we we've developed a pretty good theory about that now from an evolutionary perspective. You know, we're social primate species. We need to get along. Reciprocal altruism. You know, kin selection. All you know these you know, indirect. Uh, reciprocity, you know, there's, there's all kinds of mechanisms to explain why we behave the way we do. But I'm also going further than that and saying, you know, certain certain moral values are really better than other moral values uh, uh, in an objective, measurable sense. For example, um, South Korea versus North Korea, you know, free speech versus no free speech, you know, an open economy versus a, a, a command and control economy, you know, a democracy versus a dictatorship. The results are dramatic and measurable and different all the way from the darkness from a satellite picture from space to the height of North Koreans versus South Koreans, which is a couple inches difference because their diets are crappy because they have such a poor economy and so forth. Uh, you know, and, and so but these are measurable things about what people want to flourish, to survive and flourish. You know, this is a human nature kind of thing. And what I'm arguing in the moral arc is that we've been for centuries, we've been applying the methods of science to answer this question, 
how can we get more people into the you know realm of social conditions in which they're more likely to flourish and we've discovered that democracies are better than this that open economies are better than this that having a, a bill of rights and, and protection of free speech and and the, the freedom to to protest or worship whatever religion you want or not uh, you know these kinds of freedoms we take for granted you know these were hard-earned but also well argued from a secular perspective and even though the people that did that centuries ago would not have called themselves scientists because that word didn't even exist until 1830s uh, they they were practicing what we, we what they call natural philosophy, but what we call science. They treated it all as just an empirical question: what's the best social system we can structure to, to get the ends that we're aiming for? And I claim that that's a scientific problem. To get one's morality from a wizard in the sky qualifies as a weird belief. To get me back to the original premise of my show today and of this interview. Dr. Michael Shermer, you've been very generous with your time. Thanks for sort of walking us through some of the science of this. And thanks for all the great work you've done at Skeptic and elsewhere. Much appreciated. And we'll talk to you again soon. Great. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And thanks for having me.